Hi everyone and welcome back to Mady Brain. Today's topic is menestheses, so let's dive in. In 1861, the French physician Prosper Menier theorized that attacks of vertigo, ringing in the ear, also called tinnitus, and hearing loss came from the inner ear rather than from the brain, as was generally believed at that time. Once this idea was accepted, the name of Dr. Prosper Menier began its long association with this inner ear disease and with inner ear balance disorders in general. Menier's disease is an idiopathic condition which affects the inner ear. There are two options which could cause it. Either there is an overproduction or an impaired reabsorption of endolymph through the endolymphatic sac. Either way it leads to an accumulation within the membranous labyrinth which results in an endolymphatic hydrops. Let's do some numbers. The prevalence of meniestasis is about 200 per 100,000 inhabitants in Germany and 70 to 90 in 100,000 individuals in the US. The incidence is approximately 13 per 100,000 per year in Europe. The onset of meniestasis is between 20 and 60 years of age with a peak incidence of 40 to 60 years and women are more affected than men. So what's actually the difference between Meniere's disease and Meniere's syndrome? Meniere's disease causes an endolymphatic hydrops by mostly unknown conditions, while Meniere's syndrome causes it by known conditions, like for example infection, diet or allergies. In the end, Meniere's disease, as well as Meniere's syndrome, have both the same symptoms. All patients with Meniere's disease have an endolymphatic hydrops, but not all patients with endolymphatic hydrops have symptoms of Meniere's disease. Here you can see a figure of the cochlea with its three chambers, scala vestibuli to the left and scala tympani to the right, which contain both perilymph with high sodium concentration, and the scala media in the middle, which contains endolymph with high potassium concentration. There are two main theories for the pathophysiology. The first theory says that the overproduction or impaired reabsorption of endolymph leads to an increasing iron concentration in the scala media, followed by an increasing water influx and thus to an amplification of the hydrops. By that, the Reissner's membrane, also called vestibular membrane or vestibular wall, gets stretched. So the overproduction or impaired reabsorption of endolymph leads to backed up fluid which causes swelling and pressure, influencing the balance as well as the hearing information and this distorted information travels to the brain and causes the symptom onset. The second theory says that the accumulation of endolymph causes the Reissner's membrane to rupture, followed by mixing of endo and perilymph and an increased perilymphatic potassium. This causes the depolarization of the efferent acoustic nerve fibers and the symptoms to kick in. And after some time, the Reissner's membrane can even grow back together and restore its concentration. Here's a short but really cool animation of what I just explained to you. The typical symptoms, also called meniotriad, consists of episodic vertigo, tinnitus and low frequency hearing loss, which worsens with every episode and may lead to deafness. Most often symptoms are unilateral, but in some cases they are bilateral. Episodes decrease in frequency with age and can last from minutes to hours. If the oral symptoms disappear after vertiginous attacks, this could be due to spontaneous adhesion of the torn Reissner's membrane, also called Lermoyer syndrome. Additional symptoms could be horizontal nystagmus, with an initial brief period of irritative nystagmus towards the affected ear, followed by a 15 to 30 minutes nystagmus towards the healthy ear or even absence of nystagmus, and after that a longer period of irritative nystagmus, also called recovery nystagmus, towards the affected ear follows. But nystagmus may also be absent during clinical examination. Further symptoms are nausea and vomiting. 
The criteria for the diagnosis of Meniere's disease include two or more episodes of vertigo that last 20 minutes to 12 hours, fluctuating tinnitus or earfulness, low frequency to mid frequency sensory neural hearing loss, and no other diagnosis is suspected. The clinical examination shows unremarkable findings of the eardrum and tuning fork tests like for example the Weber test shows lateralization to the healthy ear which indicates sensory neural hearing loss of the opposite ear. The Rinnet test is positive for both sides which means air conduction is louder or longer than bone conduction. For further evaluation of hearing loss we use the pure tone audiometry. To the left we see a normal air conduction and bone conduction curve. The right picture shows that the hearing loss affects the lower frequencies. Most often this is the case in the beginning of the disease, but later on all frequencies are affected. Another test is the so-called super threshold audiometry test. Normally outer hair cells function as volume modulators. They amplify soft tones and weaken loud sounds. In cochlear disorders they are not working anymore, that means soft tones are not here that good or not at all and you are more sensitive Ouch. to loud sounds. So the span between hearing threshold and discomfort is lower than in healthy people. This is called positive recruitment. Positive recruitment is also found in Meniere's disease because outer hair cells are damaged by the endolymphatic high drops. One more test for the evaluation of hearing loss can be done via auditory evoked potentials, called electrocochleography. It measures the electrical potentials generated in the inner ear in response to stimulation by sound. The picture shows the invasive method. In Meniere's disease the electrocochleography demonstrates enhancing summating potentials and an increased summating potential to action potential ratio in the deceased ear. Vestibular function tests can be used to test for nystagmus. For example, the Frenzel googles are used to magnify lenses and illuminate the patient's eyes so that the examiner can see any spontaneous nystagmus, which is always pathologic. A newer standard for the recording is the use of video nystagmography. The caloric test is a test of each horizontal semicircular canal by rinsing each ear with warm and cold water sequentially. It causes a physiological nystagmus, which can be remembered as cows, cold opposite, warm same. It is pathological if you can see less or even no excitability at all, which shows a functional disorder. The rotary chair testing is also a test of the horizontal semicircular canals, in which you can see a physiological nystagmus. In a healthy person the horizontal nystagmus is to the direction of the rotation and when a spinning stops to the opposite direction. A vestibular deficit leads to diminished physiological nystagmus. Additional vestibular function tests can be the cervical vestibular evoked myogenic potential or CVAMP which can be used to evaluate the status of the sacral and the inferior vestibular nerve. The CVAMP actually measures the contractions of the sternocleidomastoid muscle in response to acoustic stimulation of the saccule. The ocular vestibular evoked myogenic potential or OVAMP can be used to evaluate the status of the utricle and the superior vestibular nerve. OVAMPs actually measure the contractions of the inferior oblique muscle in response to acoustic stimulation of the utricle. VEMs are asymmetric on the side of the affected ear and indicate abnormal vestibular function, but are absent in 30-50% to 50 of Meniere's disease cases. VEMs are primarily used for early diagnosis and follow-up. Of course, you can do imaging tests like for example an MRI or a CT to rule out CNS lesions, for example tumors, aneurysms, multiple sclerosis, etc. Or you can do a dehydration test also named Klokov test, which requires the administration of diuretics, for example furosemide, glycerol, which leads to a washout of the high drops and by that to an improvement of hearing loss. The acute treatment includes bed rest, vestibular suppressants, like for example demonhydrinate, benzodiazepines, etc., antiemetics, for example promethazine and citrons, and a change of lifestyle by avoiding dietary and environmental triggers like caffeine, alcohol, stress and a sodium-rich diet. Preventive measures could be 
medical therapy with diuretics or histamine analogs, or physiotherapy for balance and gait training. If no improvement is seen, interventional therapy is taken into consideration, which comprises intratympanic gentamicin or glucocorticoid injections through a ventilation tube over several weeks, which deactivates the labyrinth and decreases vertigo. Another option is vestibular neurectomy, which means surgical lysis of the vestibular bundle entering the internal auditory canal. Or saculotomy, which is not shown here, but is a method by which the endolymphatic sac and duct is surgically exposed in order to promote drainage of endolymph. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video and you want to support me, please like and subscribe to my channel or follow me on social media. Till the next time.